whether in gardens or wild corners of the earth, flowers lend an indescribable charm to the surroundings in which they grow. Widely used as objects of ornamental, social, religious and cultural value, flowers also are sites of sexual reproduction. Flowering is a major phase in the life cycle of a plant and takes place when the climate is congenial for pollination and the formation of seeds. This phase is however preceded by several physiological and morphological changes induced by hormones such as florigen present in the leaves. These changes lead to the differentiation of vegetative buds into floral buds and the development of the floral primordium, the rudimentary or preliminary stage of the flower or the flowering shoot. This primordium either bears a solitary floral bud or inflorescences that bear multiple floral buds. The buds bloom into a flower, a modified shoot with shortened internodes and nodes. From these nodes arise four modified leaf-like structures called whorls, which are arranged on the swollen end of a stalk called the thalamus. The whorls include the andrisium, gynesium, calyx, that consists of sepals and lastly the corolla comprising the petals. The calyx and corolla referred to as the perianth are bright and colorful to attract insect pollinators. The gynesium on the other hand which consists of one or many carpels or pistils represents the female reproductive part, whereas the andresium, which consists of a whirl of stamens, is the male reproductive part of the flower. Though the number and size of stamens in an andresium differ across species of flowers, the basic structure remains the same. Every stamen, for instance, consists of a filament and an anther. The filament is a long and slender stalk whose proximal end is attached either to the thalamus or the petal of the flower. The anther, on the other hand, is bilobed in nature, with each lobe being dithecus or consisting of two thecas that are separated by a longitudinal groove that runs through the anther. The transverse section of the anther reveals that its lobes form a four-sided or a tetragonal structure. In the corner of each lobe is the microsporangium, a sac-like structure which is nearly circular in outline. In a young anther, the microsporangium is surrounded by a multi-layered wall consisting of the epidermis, endothecium, middle layers and the tapetum, the innermost layer, while the center is occupied by sporogenous tissue. The epidermis, endothecium and middle layers protect the microsporangium as well as aid in dehiscence, which is the splitting of the anther walls that causes the release of pollen grains. While the tapetum, whose binucleate cells possess dense cytoplasm, nourishes the developing pollen grains, the sporogenous tissue, on the other hand, consists of a group of compactly arranged homogeneous diploid cells 
called microspore mother cells or pollen mother cells. These microspore mother cells divide meiotically to form haploid microspores which arrange themselves in a tetrad. The process of formation of microspores meiotically from a microspore mother cell is called microsporogenesis. As the anther begins to mature, both the microsporangium and microspores undergo changes. While the microsporangium develops into the pollen sacs that extend longitudinally through the length of the anther, the microspores separate from the tetrad and develop into pollen grains. Thus, the anther contains thousands of pollen grains which undergo mitosis to form two unequal cells. The larger cell, known as the vegetative cell, is characterized by a large irregular shaped nucleus, vacuoles and abundant food reserves. While the smaller cell, known as the generative cell, is distinctly spindle shaped and possesses dense cytoplasm. Moreover, the generative cell floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. Did you know that the vegetative cell and generative cell represent the two-celled stage of the pollen grain? Later, the generative cell undergoes mitotic division to produce two male gametes. The pollen grain is now said to be at the three-celled stage. After the formation of pollen grains, the endothelial cells lose water which leads to tension in their cell walls. This tension causes the dehiscence or bursting of the anther along the line of dehiscence and results in the shedding of several thousand pollen grains. Are you aware that in cereals such as Jawar, the pollen grains are shed at the three-celled stage, whereas in 60% of angiosperms, which include plants such as hibiscus, the pollen grains are shed at the two-celled stage? Pollen grains, which represent the male gametophyte, come in a wide variety of sizes, shapes and colors. A typical pollen grain, however, is spherical in shape and has a diameter measuring about 25 to 50 micrometers. It is surrounded by two layers of wall, exine and intine. Exine, the hard outer layer, is made up of sporopollenin, a tough organic material capable of resisting high temperatures and strong acids, alkalis and all natural enzymes. Hence, pollen can be well preserved as fossils. However, sporopollenin is not present in the germ spore an aperture present in the exine through which we see the germination of the pollen tube. Intine, on the other hand, is a thin and continuous inner layer of wall composed of cellulose and pectin. On the inner side of the intine is the plasma membrane that surrounds the pollen grain's cytoplasm. When pollen grains land on the stigma, they germinate into a pollen tube that carries the male gametes towards the embryo sac. This ability of the pollen grain 
to deliver the male gametes to the embryo sac is called pollen viability. However, factors such as temperature and humidity affect pollen viability. Moreover, pollen grains of different plants have different periods of viability. Pollen grains of cereals such as wheat and rice lose their viability within 30 minutes of their release. Whereas pollen grains of some members of Rosaceae, Leguminaceae and Solanaceae remain viable for months. Pollen grains, which play a vital role in plant reproduction, are also often consumed by human beings as they are rich in nutrients. Pollen products, in the form of tablets and syrups, are commonly spotted on shelves of supermarkets. Moreover, pollen is also stored in pollen banks in liquid nitrogen at 196 degrees centigrade. The pollen is later used in plant breeding programs. Pollen grains, however, can trigger allergies in some people and can cause asthma and bronchitis. In fact, the weed carrot grass or Parthenium hysterophorus and its pollen found in non-cultivated lands in Punjab causes allergies such as eczema, dermatitis and other skin diseases. Pollen formed inside the stamen plays an important role in plant propagation and also serves as a source of nutrition although in some cases it may trigger allergies. Flowers are one of the most fascinating sights to behold. Incidentally Flowers also happen to be the site of sexual reproduction as they contain the andricium and gynecium, the male and female reproductive organs of a plant. You can see many variations in the gynecium of different flowers. For example, the gynecium can be monocarpus consisting of a single pistil or carpel or it may be multicarpus in which case we see several pistils in a single flower moreover a multicarpellary gynecium may be apocarpus that is the pistils are free Syncarpus, where the pistils are fused. If you observe the structure of a pistil, you will find that it consists of the stigma at the tip, followed by the style in the middle and an ovary at the base. While the stigma is a landing platform for pollen grains, the style an elongated slender structure connects the stigma to the ovary, the basal bulging part of the pistil. Morphological studies of the ovary have revealed that it contains one or more cavities called locules or ovarian cavities that are surrounded by an ovary wall. Within the locule, you will find ovules or megasporangia that are attached to the ovary wall in a region called the placenta. These ovules may be arranged in free central, axial, marginal, parietal or basal placentation. Moreover, after fertilization, the ovules form seeds while the ovary develops into a fruit. Did you know that different flowers of different plant species have a varying number of ovules in their ovaries? 
A peach, for instance, develops from an ovary containing a solitary ovule. A papaya, on the other hand, has several ovules in its ovary and that's why you see numerous seeds in the fruit when it is split open. The ovule, considered by botanists as the forerunner of the seed, has an oval or egg-shaped body. It remains attached to the placenta by a stalk called the funicle. In fact, the ovule's body fuses with the funicle in a region called the hilum. The ovule is well protected with one or two protective coverings called integuments. These integuments later form the seed coat. The integuments cover the entire ovule except at the apex where they form a narrow opening called the micropyle. Did you know that the micropyla end acts as an entry point for the pollen tube during the process of fertilization? While the micropyle forms one end of the ovule, the chalaza forms the basal part of the ovule. At the chalazal region, we find that the funicle and integuments join the nucellus, the center region of the ovule that's made of a mass of diploid, colorless, thin-walled, parenchymatous cells containing food reserve materials. In the nucellus of a mature ovule, lies the embryo sac, the female gametophyte, which develops from a megaspore. This megaspore is formed when one of the nucellus cells, towards its micropyla end, gets differentiated into a megaspore mother cell, which can be easily distinguished from other cells due to its large size dense cytoplasm and prominent nucleus. The megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis to form four megaspores which arrange themselves in a linear tetrad. This process of formation of megaspores from the megaspore mother cell is called megasporogenesis. Of the four megaspores Usually, the one near the chalazal end becomes functional, whereas the other three, near the micropyla end, degenerate. The functional megaspore enlarges and simultaneously undergoes mitotic division to form an embryo sac. This type of formation of the embryo sac from a single megaspore is known as monosporic development. While undergoing these mitotic divisions, the nucleus of the functional megaspore first divides to form two nuclei, which move to the two opposite ends of the embryo sac. This is the two nucleate stage of the embryo sac. The mitotic divisions continue and result in the formation of the four nucleate and later the eight nucleate stages of the embryo sac. A mature embryo sac thus has eight nuclei after three mitotic divisions, which are arranged in a group of four at each end of the embryo sac. Interestingly, the mitotic divisions that occur in the megaspore's nucleus are free nuclear, which means the division of the nuclei doesn't immediately trigger cytoplasmic division and cell wall formation. Instead, we see the formation of cell walls only after the eight nucleate stage, due to which six of the eight nuclei organize into cells. The two remaining nuclei, called polar nuclei, 
migrate to the center of the embryo sac. Thus, we find the embryo sac to be in seven celled and eight nucleate stage with six cells at the poles and a large central cell with two nuclei in the center. Meanwhile, the six cells organize to form the typical structure of the embryo sac, which is now ready for fertilization. The three cells present at the calasal end, for instance, group together to form the antipodal cells, which do not have any specific function. Whereas, the three cells at the micropylar end group together to form the egg apparatus. While one of the cells functions as an egg or the female gamete, the other two cells are called synergids. If you observe the micropylar tip of the synergids, you will notice special cellular thickenings called a filiform apparatus that guides the pollen grains into the synergid. The synergids, as well as other cells, form the embryo sac, the female gametophyte born inside the pistil. Flowers are mainly responsible for bringing about fertilization and seed formation. To facilitate fertilization, it is necessary that the male gametes inside the pollen grains and the female gamete inside the ovule are brought together. However, since the gametes are immotile, pollen grains have to be transferred to the stigma. This process of transfer of pollen to the stigma of a flower, brought about by agents such as insects, wind and water is called pollination. Pollination can be of two types, self-pollination and cross-pollination. When pollination takes place within the same flower or between flowers of the same plant, it is known as self-pollination. In plants, self-pollination can occur either through autogamy or gaitanogamy. In autogamy, pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma of the same flower. and is seen in cleistogamous flowers or flowers which do not open at all. Produced by plants such as viola, oxalis, camelina and arachis hypogea or peanut The anthers and stigma of these flowers lie very close to each other. When anthers dehyce, pollen grains get deposited on the stigma, which ensures the production of seed sets even in the absence of pollinators. Autogamy, however, is rare in chasmogamous flowers, which open and expose their anthers and stigma as it requires synchrony between pollen release and stigma receptivity. In gaitanogamy, the second type of self-pollination, pollen is transferred from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower of the same plant. Apart from self-pollination, cross-pollination is also commonly seen in plants. This type of pollination involves the transfer of pollen grains from the flower of one plant to the stigma of the flower of another plant of the same type. This type of pollination is called 
Zinagami or Alagami. Interestingly, Zinagami is the only type of pollination that brings genetically different types of pollen grains to the stigma. In both cross-pollination and self-pollination, pollinating agents play a vital role. These agents include biotic agents such as insects, birds, bees, butterflies, and mammals such as bats, as well as abiotic agents such as wind and water. Incidentally, pollination in a majority of plants is aided by biotic pollinating agents, which get attracted by flowers which vary from each other to attract their specific pollinator. Insect pollinated flowers, for instance, are usually large and fragrant. However, if they are small, they are bunched together in an inflorescence to make them conspicuous. Moreover, these flowers produce pollen grains as well as large quantities of nectar to reward the agents. When a pollinating agent comes in contact with the anther, its body gets covered in a coat of sticky pollen grains. When the agent sits on another flower to suck the nectar, the pollen present on their bodies comes into contact with the stigma, thus completing the process of pollination. Conversely, flowers pollinated by butterflies are usually lightly scented and brightly colored, with nectar not very deeply hidden, while those pollinated by beetles and flies secrete a rotten odor. Flowers pollinated by birds, on the other hand, have large odorless orange or red tubes which are rich in honey. Certain plants attract pollinating insects by offering them shelter. For instance, Amorphophallus, a six-foot tall flower, attracts pollinating insects by offering them a safe haven to lay their eggs. In the yucca plant, on the other hand, a female moth transfers the pollen of another flower to the stigma and simultaneously deposits her eggs in the locule of the flower's ovary. The larvae, which hatch out of the eggs, start consuming some of the developing seeds while leaving enough of them to propagate the plant. Thus, both the moth and the plant are dependent on each other for the completion of their respective life cycles. However, certain birds and insects such as the bumblebee visit flowers for nectar and pollen but don't bring about pollination. These creatures are referred to as pollen robbers. Honeybees as well as other insects also pollinate a large number of aquatic flowering plants such as the freshwater lily. However, in certain freshwater plants such as Vallisneria and Hydrilla and marine sea grasses such as Zostera, pollination occurs by water. This is also known as hydrophily. In Vallisneria, for example, the female plant produces a long-stalked female flower that reaches the surface of the water. The male plant, on the other hand, remains submerged in water, where it produces several tiny floral buds. Upon maturing, the buds rise to the water's surface and open up to expose the anthers. Pollen released from the anthers is carried by water currents where some of them eventually come in contact with the stigma. 
In the case of Zostera, a dioecious seagrass, the male and female flowers remain submerged in water. The male flowers produce long and ribbon-like pollen grains which have a, a mucilaginous covering that protects them from getting wet. The pollen released in water is carried by water currents towards the submerged stigma and thus pollination is completed. Surprisingly, in aquatic plants, wind pollination, also called anemophily, is more widespread than water pollination. Wind pollination also occurs in terrestrial plants such as grass, bamboo, coconut and maize. These plants possess a compact inflorescence with well exposed stamens that allow easy dispersal of pollen and a large feathery pistil which makes it easy to trap pollen. The pollen, which is light and non-sticky, is produced in large quantities. A single flower of cannabis, for instance, produces 5 lakh pollen grains to compensate the loss of pollen associated with wind pollination. Thus, wind, water, as well as biotic pollinating agents, bring about pollination. An important process that ultimately leads to fertilization and the production of seeds in plants. In flowering plants, pollination is an important mechanism that aids in transferring the pollen released from the anther to the stigma of the flower. If the pollen is of the right type, the stigma induces it to germinate and produce a pollen tube. The pollen tube containing the two male gametes then secretes hydrolytic enzymes which help the pollen tube to digest the tissues of the style as it travels down to enter the ovule through the micropyle, a minute opening in the ovule. Inside the ovule, the pollen tube encounters the embryo sac, the female gametophyte containing three antipodals, two synergids, an egg cell, and a central cell with two polar nuclei. The pollen tube now enters one of the synergids through the filiform apparatus during which it ruptures and releases the male gametes into the synergids cytoplasm. Of the two male gametes, one enters the egg cell and fuses with its nucleus. This fusion, known as syngamy, or first fertilization results in the formation of a diploid zygote. Meanwhile, the other male gamete moves towards the two polar nuclei and fertilizes them to produce a triploid primary endosperm nucleus or PEM. Incidentally, this fusion is known as triple fusion as it involves the fusion of three haploid nuclei. After the triple fusion, the central cell is called the primary endosperm cell. 
Did you know that Singami and Triple Fusion together represent double fertilization? A phenomenon unique to flowering plants? Double fertilization is followed by several post-fertilization events which eventually transform the ovule into a seed and the ovary into a fruit. These events include degeneration of the antipodals, synergids and the development of the zygote into an embryo and the primary endosperm cell into the endosperm by repeated mitotic divisions. Endospermic development is of three types. Nuclear endospermic development, cellular endospermic development, and halobial endospermic development. In nuclear endospermic development, which is the most common type of endosperm development, the primary endosperm nucleus divides mitotically and forms free nuclei. This division is sometimes followed by cytoplasmic divisions from the periphery. In the case of cellular endospermic development, which is seen in plants such as utricularia, the division of the primary endosperm nucleus is immediately followed by cytoplasmic divisions. Halobial endospermic development, on the other hand, is an intermediate type of development where half the cells develop in cellular mode and the other half undergo free nuclear divisions. Interestingly, the number of free nuclei formed prior and post cellularization differs greatly. Take the case of a tender coconut fruit where the coconut water that you see is actually thousands of free nuclei. As the coconut matures, cellularization leads to a decrease in the quantity of water and the formation of the white kernel, the cellular endosperm. Therefore, in the coconut, we find both free nuclear endosperm made up of thousands of nuclei and cellular endosperm. Histological studies have shown that endosperm contains stored food in the form of starch or proteins as in cereals or oil as in castor or coconut. This food provides nourishment to the zygote while it is developing into an embryo. It is interesting to note that the endosperm also forms a major source of nutrition for human beings. Incidentally, the development of the embryo, also known as embryogeny, occurs only after a certain amount of the endosperm has developed. In fact, in some plants such as groundnut that belongs to the bean family, the mature seeds lack endosperm as it gets completely absorbed by the developing embryo. When these seeds germinate, the cotyledons or seed leaves become the source of nutrition for the embryo. However, in mature seeds of castor, we see that the endosperm is retained as a storage tissue. In the case of cereals, the aluron layer, which forms a part of the endosperm, stores food as well as secretes amylase enzyme for the digestion of stored starch during germination of the seed. Studies by botanists have revealed that during early embryogeny, 
The zygote divides into two cells. The basal suspensor cell towards the micropyla end and a terminal embryo cell towards the calasal end. The basal suspensor cell further undergoes mitotic divisions and forms four to eight cells which push the terminal embryo cell into the tissue of the endosperm to allow it to derive nourishment. Moreover, the terminal embryo cell also undergoes divisions to form a group of cells known as proembryo, which subsequently develops into a globular, heart-shaped and torpedo-shaped mature embryo. The structure of a mature dicotyledonous embryo is nonetheless different from that of a monocotyledonous embryo. A dicotyledonous embryo, for instance, consists of an embryonal axis and two cotyledons. The epicotyl, the portion of the embryonal axis above the level of the cotyledons, terminates with the plumule or stem tip. Below the level of the cotyledons is a cylindrical portion called the hypercotyl that terminates at the radical or root tip which is covered with the root cap. On the other hand, a monocotyledonous embryo commonly found in the grass family has only one cotyledon called a scutellum situated towards the lateral side of the embryonal axis. The upper portion of this axis, known as the epicotyl, lies above the attachment of the scutellum. The epicotyl has a shoot apex and a few leaf primordia enclosed in the coleoptil, a hollow foliar structure. The lower end of the embryonal axis has the radical and root cap covered in an undifferentiated sheath called the coleoriza. Interestingly, the various parts of the embryo develop differently as the seed germinates. In this manner, the embryo as well as endosperm develops from the zygote and primary endosperm cell after fertilization has taken place in flowering plants. For us, Fruit means a mango, papaya, apple or a banana. However, for a botanist, fleshy and juicy mangoes or papayas are as much a fruit as are groundnuts or cashew nuts, which are dry in nature. Fruit, the final product of sexual reproduction, develops from an ovary post-fertilization. Incidentally, in most cases, fertilization and the development of fruit triggers the withering of other parts of the flower, including the sepals, petals, and stamens. However, in some cases, like apple, floral parts such as the thalamus become a part of the fruit. Such fruit in which other parts of the flower besides the ovary are involved in the formation of the fruit are called false fruit. On the other hand, fruit like mango and papaya that develop only from the ovary are called true fruit. Interestingly, while mango and papaya develop after fertilization, fruit like banana develop without fertilization and are called parthenocarpic fruit. Moreover, in the case of banana, the edible parts develop from the inner tissues of the ovary and the brown specks that we see are the remnants of the ovules. If you cut open a fruit, you will see that it is made up of two parts, the pericarp and one or more seeds. The pericarp is the fruit wall that develops from the walls of the ovary. The seed, the second part of the fruit, is actually a fertilized ovule. 
Typically, a seed is enclosed in a tough outer protective covering called the seed coat, which is actually the hardened integument of the ovule. The micropyle of the ovule persists in the seed as a small pore through which water and oxygen enter when the seed germinates. Inside the seed coat lie one or more cotyledons as well as the endosperm, embryo and embryonal axis. The cotyledons, which are often fleshy and swollen, contain abundant food reserves. Endosperm, on the other hand, is a nutritive tissue nourishing the developing embryo. Interestingly, in certain plants such as bean and pea, the developing embryo completely consumes the endosperm. Such seeds that contain no endosperm are called non-albuminous seeds. However, in wheat and maize, a residual endosperm is seen as it is not completely consumed by the embryo during the developmental stage. Such seeds are called albuminous seeds. Sometimes, in addition to the endosperm, seeds also contain remnants of the nucellus called the perisperm that also stores food material. Such seeds are called perispermic seeds. Black pepper is a common example of a perispermic seed. Whether a perispermic or albuminous seed, as the embryo begins to develop, the seed starts to mature and lose its water content to become relatively dry. A mature seed, therefore, has only 15 to 20 percent of its mass as moisture content. Moreover, the embryo's growth rate slows, and under unfavorable conditions, it may enter a state of inactivity called dormancy, during which the embryo develops an increased resistance to desiccation. Conversely, conducive conditions that provide favorable temperature and appropriate water awaken the dormant embryo and the seed germinates with the embryo developing into a seedling. This ability of the seed to germinate is called seed viability and it varies across seeds of different species. The seeds of spinach, for instance, remain viable only for a year or so, whereas muskmelon seeds remain viable for five years. Did you know that excavations around the Arctic tundra region have led to the finding of seeds of Lupinus arcticus, which remained viable for 10,000 years before germinating and flowering? Seeds, a character unique to angiosperms, also offer many advantages to these groups of plants. Seeds have special mechanisms such as bursting or wings that help them disperse to new habitats, thereby allowing plants to claim new areas to propagate. In addition, the seed's tough outer coat protects the embryo from hostile environmental conditions. Upon germination, Seeds also have a better survival rate, as they are guaranteed nourishment by the cotyledons. As seeds are products of sexual reproduction, they help bring about genetic variations within plant species. Genetic variations are the key to evolution, and also help plant species adapt and survive in different environments. Seeds, which help in the propagation of angiosperms, also form the crux of agriculture. Interestingly, farmers in recent times have started using hybrid seeds developed through artificial cross-pollination techniques. These seeds guarantee increased productivity and superior crop quality. However, when seeds born by hybrid crops are sown, the seedlings do not exhibit the hybrid characters 
due to the segregation of characters. This forces farmers to purchase new hybrid seeds year after year, which is an expensive affair. To address this problem, botanists are trying to understand the genetics of apomixis and transfer apomictic genes into hybrid plants. Apomixis is a form of asexual reproduction in which the seeds or embryos are formed without fertilization. In fact, seeds or embryos either develop from an unfertilized egg which did not undergo meiosis or from the cells of the integument or nucellus. Botanists believe that converting hybrid crops into apomicts will prevent the segregation of characters in seeds produced by hybrid crops and thereby eliminate the need to purchase hybrid seeds every year as the seedlings produced by the apomicts will resemble their parents genetically. Did you know that plants such as grasses and those belonging to the family Asteraceae and Rutaceae are common examples of apomicts? Moreover, in certain apomicts such as Citrus Jambiri, which belongs to the Rutaceae family, the nucella cells surrounding the embryo sac divide and protrude into the embryo sac. Later, these cells develop into embryos and hence a single seed contains more than one embryo. This phenomenon of having more than one embryo in a seed is called polyembryony. Thus, though we have gained a lot of knowledge about the formation of seeds and fruit, there are many mysteries that scientists are still trying to unlock.